Greetings and thank you all for coming here. On behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Um, I am the coordinator for our program in Catholic Social Thought. And this conference every year brings together bishops, scholars, business leaders, um, and research economists to come together to talk about issues of great importance to our society. And I don't think that it's just the Pope's recent encyclical that helps us become aware that the issue of environmental degradation is one of those issues that reaches not only across the globe, but also to um, the very heart of our city. Um, so I'm very grateful that you're all here today. I'm especially thankful for each of our speakers um, for the contribution that they are offering. I'd like to introduce to you our chair and moderator tonight, Valerie Ramey. Valerie Ramey received her BA in Economics and Spanish from the University of Arizona, graduating summa cum laude, and went on to earn a PhD in Economics from Stanford University. She is currently a professor of Economics at the University of California, San Diego, and a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. She has served as co-editor of the American Economic Review, chair of the Economics Department at UCSD, and as a member of several National Science Foundation advisory panels, the executive committee of the American, Ec the American Economics Association and the Federal Economics Statistics Advisory Committee. She currently serves on the panel of economic advisors for the Congressional Budget Office and is an associate editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics and the Journal of Political Economy. Professor Ramey has published numerous scholarly articles on the sources of business cycles, trends in wage inequality, the effect of monetary and fiscal policy, the impact of volatility on growth, and links between time use and educational outcomes. She has received research grants from the National Science Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and the Bradley Foundation. And I don't think you'll find it on her CV or perhaps buried down at the bottom, but she also plays a vital role for us by chairing this year's conference um, committee, economic, uh, the Economics and Catholic Social Thought Committee, and helping us pull this whole program together. So please join me in welcoming her and all of our panelists to the stage. On behalf of Lumen Christi and CRADO, the Catholic Research Economics Discussion Organization, I'm pleased to welcome you to this forum on caring for our common home, economics, environment, and Catholic social thought. Uh, we are absolutely delighted with the panel of leading thinkers on this issue that we were able to assemble for today. Our first speaker is our keynote speaker, and it, uh, Archbishop Wensky, who I will talk about in a minute. He will speak for about 30 minutes, and then we will have the four respondents talk. I will t I'll introduce them when it's time for the respondents to talk. So we're delighted that T Thomas Wensky, who is the Archbishop of Miami, uh, is here to give our keynote speech. He was ordained in Miami in 1976. He earned a BA in philosophy and a master's in divinity from Boynton Beach Seminary and a master's in sociology from Fordham University. Besides his duties in the Archdiocese of Miami, he has served as chair of the US United States Catholic Conference Bishops Committee on Migration and chair of the Conference Committee on International Policy. And currently, he continues as a consultant to the Committee on Migration and a member of the conference's Secretariat for the Church in Latin America. The Committee for the International Justice and Peace and Clinic Catholic Legal Immigration Network Incorporated. He currently serves as the chairman for the US Catholic 
Conference of Bishops Committee on Domestic Justice and Human Development, and has spro spoken prolifically promoting Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si. We are absolutely delighted that he is our keynote speaker. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Last August, somebody from the New York Times called me and asked me to comment on Laudato Auto Si. I don't remember what I said, but uh, apparently it impressed somebody because uh, a few days later, the director of my communications office in the Archdiocese got a call and uh, inviting me to appear on the Steve Colbert show. <laughs> and my communications director said yes before she asked me. <laughs> so when Pope Francis was in Madison Square Garden celebrating Mass, I was pre-recording the uh, or recording the show, uh, the Steve Colbert show, in which he wanted to ask me about Laudato Si, because I'm from Miami, and Miami is sinking, according to Steve Colbert. And actually, uh, there is uh, a problem in Miami about six times a year. We have what we call king tides. And Miami Beach, where all those young people like to, uh, to party, uh, the streets become flooded. Um, part of the whole issue of what we're here today about. So uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, maybe I was invited because one of you might have saw the Steve Colbert show. <laughs> but I'm very happy to be uh, with, uh, with such an impressive group to discuss this important encyclical. And I thank the board, the staff of the Lumen Christi Institute for inviting me to be part of the symposium. Pope Francis uses the word dialogue very frequently. For him, it's not a trite word. He wants us to engage with one another, to be led to an encounter of the heart where significant concepts can be discussed and real change can occur. I think we'd be proud of the dialogue we are having today and the spirit the Lumen Christi Institute brings to these forums on economics and Catholic social thought. In our highly politicized uh, reality or space for these conversations is harder to come by. So I'm grateful for the work of the Institute, which is in keeping with the best hopes of the church and the vision of your founders. Pope, the Pope's encyclical on the care for our common home has been called a document which is about everything. And I think I agree with that assessment. For those interested in exploring the intersection of economics and church teaching, Pope Francis gives us a full course meal, one that we cannot possibly consume entirely in just a couple of hours. So I will attempt to achieve just three things this evening. First, I'll provide you, I hope, with a sense of the moorings of Laudato Si, explore papal teachings. Next, I will take up the concept of integral ecology, which I think, I believe, is the key to unlocking the encyclical so that we can understand the magnitude of the project before us. Finally, we will try to understand the kind of renewal Pope Francis has in mind, with an emphasis on some of the economic questions of interest to this audience. There's a lot of energy and good feeling about Laudato Si. We see it in our parishes where hundreds of people are showing up to events to discuss in study groups this encyclical nearly a year after its, its release. Our church has had much to say on the environment, on environmental stewardship for some time. Our roots are described in the book of Genesis, make, and they make clear our abiding obligation to care for the things of the earth. Just after he created Adam, we read that the Lord God then took man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. 
Humanity was charged with this cultivation for all time. As our ability to impact our surroundings has increased, we should not be surprised to see the church highlight how failures to meet our stewardship obligations endanger life today and threaten future generations. In addition to these biblical roots, Pope Francis builds upon the teachings of his predecessors. Since the Catholic Church spoke into the, at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, which rerum novarum, popes have written social encyclicals in order to bring church teachings into the concrete realities of their given age. Back then, Pope Leo witnessed human beings increasingly used and abused as mere inputs into a machine of progress, and he urged employers to be more humane and to treat workers justly. He outlined the dignity of labor and made clear that our economic efforts must be at the service of people and not the other way around. And we've heard Pope Francis say essentially the same thing on many, many occasions. So there are many parallel notes struck in Laudato Si and Rium Navarum. There is an analysis of media concerns mixed with enduring principles. Pope Francis also seeks continuity with his immediate predecessors. In fact, St. John Paul II's 1990 World Day of Peace message could be described as the blueprint, blueprint for Laudato Si. St. John Paul's short message addresses the biblical account of our stewardship obligations, the interdependence of our relationships various ecological crises, the need for international cooperation and solidarity with the poor, as well as a call for dramatic change in lifestyles. Pope Benedict XVI, in his World Day of Peace message in 2010, builds on this foundation and emphasizes sustainable development and renewed global inter 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 intergenerational solidarity. You know, during Pope Benedict's reign, he was described many times in the press as the Green Pope because he put uh, solar panels on the roof of the audience hall, the Paul VI audience hall. He purchased a forest to offset the carbon imprint of, of the Vatican. So this was Pope Benedict. He was the Green Pope. So I guess we have to call Pope Francis the Greener Pope. And this is important to remember, especially for those who remain a bit troubled by Pope Francis's excursion into the environmental waters. We should remember that other popes have waded in those waters many years before. Given that Laudato Si has such breadth, Pope Francis gives us a key to help us organize the material and that key is the term integral ecology. In paragraph 119, the Holy Father paints a vivid picture of this concept. He says, if the present ecological crisis is one small sign of the ethical, cultural, and spiritual crisis of modernity, we cannot presume to heal our relationships with nature and the environment without healing all fundamental human relationships. Our relationship with the environment can never be isolated from our relationship with others and with God. Otherwise, it would be nothing more than romantic individualism dressed up in ecological garb. Or what I told Steve Colbert, Laudato Si is about relationships. You gotta get our relationship with God right, our relationship with our fellow man right, if we're gonna hope to get our relationship with Mother Earth right. An integral ecology recognizes that our lack of concern about the degradation of the environment is ultimately a symptom of our sickness of soul. Our relationships with God and our neighbors are broken from sin, and this reality is seeping in increasingly deadly ways into everything we do and touch. We can't fix one relationship in isolation. We must repair the damage to all if we are to make real progress. 
The Pope details the damage from this rupture, which is evident everywhere. In our relationship with the earth, the Holy Father zeroes in on the impacts of pollution, lack of clean water, toxic waste, climate change, the latter of which he calls one of the principal challenges facing humanity in our day. Pope Francis writes as a moral and spiritual guide, not as a scientist or a politician. He acknowledges that, quote, on many concrete questions, the church has no reason to offer a definite, definitive opinion. She knows that honest debate must be encouraged among experts. But he concludes by saying, but we need only take a frank look at the facts to see that our common home is falling into serious disrepair. Pope Francis explains that people of goodwill ought not to ignore the significant level of scientific evidence on climate change. And I'm reminded of the US bishop's statement, Clim global climate change, a plea for prudence, dialogue, and the common good, which in 2001 we said, quote, significant levels of scientific consensus, even in a situation with less than full certainty, where the consequences of not acting are serious, justifies and indeed can even oblige our taking action intended to avert potential dangers. In other words, if enough evidence indicates that the present course of action could jeopardize human, humankind's well-being, prudence dictates taking, mitigating, or preventative action. What we bishops said, and what the Pope is saying is that even though the science of climate change might have its detractors, prudence dictates that we cannot just wait for those who might yet still drag their feet in the face of the evidence. We can make an analogy to smoking. And still today there are some that would reject what doctors say about the health risk of smoking. Because everyone can point to somebody that's 82 years old and has smoked two packs a day. Uh, but given what we know and what the doctors tell us, it's prudent to try to stop smoking, even though there's not 100% consensus across the board. It's prudent. Evidence of contamination in our relationships with others doesn't end with the damaged relationship with nature. Our throwaway culture, a favorite phrase of Pope Francis, our throwaway culture is not just about McDonald's wrappers along the side of the highway. It's extended to human beings as well. And in Laudato Si, as part of this integral ecology, he zeroes in on how we throw away life in the womb, how we neglect the disabled, and show little respect for the lives and the contributions of the elderly. This is a moral pollution, as bad as the pollution of rivers and of lakes. You know, if we want to keep uh, septic tanks from polluting our rivers, Shouldn't we also be concerned about pornography polluting the minds of young people? This is a way to make the ecological condition really integral across all three of those relationships. In our current age, human beings themselves have become, have become commodities of desire. Human trafficking has become a massive global industry, a juggernaut of filth and slavery, fueled by a pollution of the heart that is not easily remediated. Our ecological challenges weigh heavily on those who can least carry the burden, the poor. Those who suffer in poverty have a special claim on our attention. And we should consider how our decisions impact them and look for ways to deepen solidarity. And really, whether decisions are made or not made, the first people that will pay the consequences, one way or the other, are gonna be the poor. 
where aid to developing countries displaces the unique cultural qualities of peoples, Pope Francis points out that the loss can also be significant. He writes, the disappearance of a culture can be just as serious or even more serious than the disappearance of a species of plant or animal. With all these challenges in the area of human ecology, the Pope explains that it, is, it becomes difficult to hear the cry of nature itself. When we don't attend to human ecology, we don't attend to natural ecology. In our relationship with God, Pope Francis rewards of the dangers of both anthropocentrism and biocentrism, which each in their own way attempt to turn the creative design of God on its head. Thus, he cautions against the myth of unlimited technological progress on one extreme, and a belief that humankind is capable of eventually answering every question and facing every challenge through its own power alone. Now I feel like Marco Rubio. <laughs> At the same time, the Pope protests against those who view men and women and all their interventions as no more than a threat, who hold that the presence of the human beings on the planet should be reduced and all forms of intervention prohibited. All of this might sound bleak, but Laudato Si is meant to be a hope-filled document. In fact, Pope Francis provides us with an authentic roadmap for renewal of all things. This renewal must permeate our interactions and transactions with one another. Of course, this year we celebrate 125 years since Rerum Navarum appeared. And even today, Pope Leo's encyclical gives us many insights. In the opening paragraphs of that document, he, provide, he provided a dire assessment that the spirit of revolutionary change, which has long been disturbing the nations of the world, should have passed beyond the sphere of politics and made its influence felt in the cognate sphere of practical economies is not surprising. The elements of the conflict now raging are unmistakable and the vast expansion of industrial pursuits and the marvelous discoveries of science and the change in relations between masters and workmen and the enormous fortunes of some few individuals and the utter poverty of the masses as also finally in the prevailing moral degeneracy. The momentous gravity of the state of things now obtaining fills every mind with painful apprehension. Could have been written this morning. Our lives have improved in many ways since 1891 when Rerum Navarro came out. Yet, along with a good deal of positive change, fresh wounds to human dignity have arisen in the technology and information ages that have followed. These developments have proven toxic because they combine with a steep moral decline and a growing self-focus. Many maintain an unyielding belief in the inevitable march of technology and science as authentic progress. But that trajectory is a myth. Empty of moral constraint, we see evidence every day that the question, ought we, is now being replaced with the question, how soon can we, with devastating results. We are more addicted to acquiring and less interested in discerning what is sufficient to live out our vocations. Pope Francis says, humanity has changed profoundly and the accumulation of constant novelties exalts a superficiality which pulls us in one direction. It becomes difficult to pause and recover depth in life. The result in Pope Francis's view is a self-absorbed culture which can no longer detect its own insatiable appetites. The emptier a person's heart is, he writes, the more he or she needs things to buy, own, and consume. It becomes almost impossible to accept the limits imposed by reality. In this horizon, a genuine sense of the common good also disappears. 
As these attitudes become more widespread, social norms are respected only to the extent that they do not clash with personal needs. We want relationships to be convenient for us, to fit our desires no matter the human cost. Often we seek connection in our own terms and approach even the most profound things in a transactional way. Quoting Benedict XVI, Pope Francis notes that the external deserts in the world are growing because the internal deserts have become so vast. For this reason, the ecological crisis is also a summons to profound interior conversion. It's no easy thing to bring people to a deeper interior life. In Plato's allegory of the cave, he describes souls living in an underground existence, shackled in darkness so that they can only see what's in front of their faces. If taken by force from their mode of living, Socrates shows us that there is pain and rage and eyes unable to see in the bright light of truth. When they finally have eyes to see, these individuals will surely experience a harsh backlash from those remaining in darkness, those who still take comfort in this familiarity. So it is. In a world that needs to recapture a sense of true purpose, our, hearts, our heads are down, our vision limited. Even the most well-intentioned people have difficulty breaking free of distraction and materialism. And so, Bo Francis calls the question. He says, we urgently need a humanism capable of bringing together the different fields of knowledge, including economics, in the service of a more integral and integrating vision. Today, the analysis of environmental problems cannot be separated from the analysis of human, family, work-related, and urban contexts, nor from how individuals relate to themselves, which leads in turn to how they relate to others and to the environment. We hunger for a conversion of heart, and collectively we need it every bit as much as we did in 1891. In this par paradoxical time of isolating globalism, Pope Francis asks us to return to that simplicity, which allows us to stop and appreciate the small things, to be grateful for the opportunities which life affords us to be spiritually detached from what we possess, and not to succumb to sadness for what we lack. He's calling us to be countercultural. He asks the various disciplines to enter into an examination of conscience. We must determine where advances once intended to serve us have become our, our masters in our own lives and in our communal life. If everything is related, the Pope explains, then the health of a society's institutions has consequences for the environment and the quality of human life. This is true from the level of the family up to international bodies. Today, moral pollutants have poisoned our vital sources of strength and support, and this is why the church wades into these waters. Because as Pope Paul VI said, the church is an expert in humanity. How often do we examine the question as what is sufficient and not get swept up with all those things with our simply within our reach? Shouldn't we ask what is required of others in order for our desires to be satisfied? We have to admit to ourselves that the erosion of both soul and soil has spread to our economic structures and transactions. Our systems will necessarily become polluted when our hearts and minds have already become so. So to begin our journey towards restoration, we must start with our relationship with God. As Christians, our faith provides us with the ability to connect with the Creator in intimate ways, including in prayer and to the channels of grace. Sacraments are privileged ways, the Pope tells us, in which nature is taken up by God to become a means of mediating supernatural life. Through our worship of God, we are invited to embrace the world on a different plane. Water, oil, fire, and colors are taken up and all their symbolic power and incorporated into our act of praise. The Pope points us to the culmination of the mystery of the Incarnation. In the Eucharist, 
fullness is already achieved. It is the living center of the universe, the overflowing core of love and of inexhaustible life. Of course, nature, nature is a critical place of encounter with God. It ought to inspire wonder and a sense of gratitude for the majesty and power of the Creator. Having thus placed ourselves in a right relationship with God, we can work to fix our other relationships, relationships that are vital. In place of isolation and use of another, the Pope proposes a culture of encounter and solidarity. Human beings possess the dignity above all other creatures. And opening ourselves to encounter and to acknowledge others will aid us as we seek ways to strengthen our social bonds and protect creation. If we combat throwaway attitudes towards people and our daily interactions, Pope Francis is convinced and convinced that our new outlook will impel us to act with others on every level, at times sacrificing short-term benefits for long-term solidarity and gain. He underscores the importance of global consensus towards sustainable energy production. And he urges the world community to work together towards meaningful international agreements. And really, you, you might have an idea of Paris that it didn't do enough, but it couldn't have done what it did without the Pope's push, without the Auto Sea. The Pope encourages development, developed nations to assist poorer countries toward cleaner energy solutions. Where corporations seek to harness natural resources in developing countries, they must ensure that the land and people are not left in worsening and dangerous circumstances. At the same time, he doesn't dismiss, dismiss the power of the individual even as he lifts up concerted action. A person who is mindful of his consumption, who recycles, uses public transportation, turns off unnecessary lights and the like, can make a real impact. He's not just subscribing to a worldly environmentalism, and he has confidence that we can be a powerful leaven. He warns against international pressure, which makes reproductive health a condition for economic aid, and rejects the claim that population growth is at the root of the current environmental crisis. And so, Laudato Si is about everything, as I said. And the task before us is an enormous one. In order to succeed, Every segment of society must engage the question. And this is why dialogues like this one are so important. Again, I thank the Lumen Christi Institute for the honor of being with you today. And I look forward to the contributions of the panel and the good discussion following. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. All right, we have four respondents uh, to complete the panel, and I will introduce all of them right now, and then they will each come up in turn. Uh, Christopher Barrett, who's at the far end of the stage, is Stephen B. and Janice G. Ashley, Professor of Applied Economics and Management, and an International Professor of Agriculture at the Charles H. Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management, as well as Professor in the Department of Economics and a Fellow at the David R. Atkinson Center for a Sustainable Future, as well as Deputy Dean and Dean of Academic Affairs at the College of Business, all at Cornell, all at Cornell University. He has won several university, national, international awards for teaching, research, and public outreach, and is an elected fellow of both the Agricultural, Cultural, and Applied Economics Association and of the African Association of Agricultural Economists. Professor Barrett's teaching, outreach, and research explore why unnecessary injustice continues to disfigure a rich, technologically advanced world and what individuals and institutions can do to improve matters. Our second respondent is Mary Evelyn Tucker, seated in the middle. She is a senior lecturer and research scholar at Yale University, where she holds appointments in the Divinity School and the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. She is co-director with John Grimm at the Forum on Religion and Ecology at Yale. This arose out of a series of 10 conferences that they organized at Harvard on world religions and ecology that resulted in 10 edited volumes from Harvard. She's also a research associate at the Reischauer Institute of Japanese Studies at Harvard. 
In 2011, she completed The Journey of the Universe with Brian Schwimm, which includes a volume published by Yale University Press, a PBS film, and an educational series of interviews. Among her many publications is Worldly Wonder, Religions Enter Their Ecological Phase in 2003. Michael Greenstone, who is seated between Chris and Mary, is the Milton Friedman Professor of Economics and the Director of the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago here. Previously, Greenstone was the 3M Professor of Environmental Economics in the Department of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Director of the Hamilton Project. From 2009 to 2010, he served as the Chief Economist at the White House's Council of Economic Advisors. His research is focused on estimating the costs and benefits of environmental quality and the consequences of government regulation. Among Professor Greenstone's many honors, he is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, faculty director of the E2E, uh, E2E Project, director of the Climate Change, Environment, and Natural Resources Research Program of the International Growth Center, a senior fellow of the Brookings Institution, and research associate, associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Ram Ramanathan, who is seated next to His Excellency the Archbishop, is a distinguished professor of atmospheric and climate sciences at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. He currently chairs an international science team from Asia, Africa, and Latin America under the Atmospheric Brown Clouds Program, sponsored by the United Nations Environmental Program. Professor Ramanathan has been conducting original research in climate and atmospheric science since the 1970s. He discovered the super greenhouse effect of halo carbon CFCs in 1975 and used observations to quantify the large global warming effect of black carbon. In 2013, he was awarded the top environment prize from the United Nations, the Champions of Earth for Science and Innovation. He has been elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the Pontifical Academy by Pope John Paul II, and the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He is now serving in Pope Francis's Council for the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. So please join me in welcoming our august panel of respondents. Chris Barrett will speak first. Thank you very much, Valerie, for an unnecessarily generous introduction. And thank you to International House and Lumen Christi for inviting me here. I'm slightly embarrassed. This is my very first visit to the University of Chicago. And I'm impressed coming from a place like Ithaca at what wonderful weather you have in Chicago. <laughs> it's really quite impressive. Um, I'm also delighted to have a chance to reflect on Laudate Si a bit. I, as Valerie explained, am a development and agricultural economist. So my work focuses at an area of intersection, the sector of the economy in which humanity is most intimately engaged with nature, agriculture, and our consumption of the fruits of agriculture, food. So today I, I want to briefly reflect upon the relationship between the food security challenge we face in the world today and environmental degradation. And at one point, I'm actually going to quarrel a bit with some people's interpretation of Laudate Si. So let me start by simply stating the fairly obvious point that reducing poverty and reducing hunger or food insecurity, however you might like to term it, these are very closely related. And they're intimately bound up with the conservation of natural resources of stemming the degradation of nature in whatever form, whether it's soil erosion, biodiversity loss, deforestation, what have you. These are each independently challenges of the very highest order. Uh, these are challenges that are economic to those of us who think about economic problems, but they're equally challenges that are deeply moral, and that's the essence of the Pope's encyclical. The challenges are intrinsically linked in a setting such as this one in northern Kenya that I photographed, it's impossible to understand human existence and the livelihoods that people pursue without thinking about what's the course followed by natural resources, what's happening to the soils, what's happening to the wildlife in the area, what's happening to water. The feedback, the very closely coupled feedback between natural systems and human systems in the settings 
populated by the world's poorest populations, who remain overwhelmingly rural. Keep in mind that more than 70% of the world's extreme poor continue to work in agriculture, primarily in Africa and Asia, but also in Latin America, and here in North America, where many of the po poorest populations are, are itinerant farm workers, for example. But the, the feedback between the human system and the natural system is very tight. And there's bi-directional causality. Errors we make in economic management feed back into problems of environmental degradation, which in turn limit what we can do in economic productivity terms. And each are affected by broader forces, especially macroeconomic and political forces, in places like northern Kenya where uh, ethnic warfare, the trafficking in small arms, et cetera, have become increasingly difficult and intractable problems. Those are causing problems both for people and for nature. We unfortunately focus on one or the other of these problems in isolation far too often. We very rarely dare to tackle the coupled system as a whole for the obvious reason that it's very difficult. This is a hard scientific problem to tackle. Each independently is complicated. But I submit that we need to be a little more daring and we need to be trying harder to tackle these together. I'm gonna to speak about one very specific challenge we face, the challenge of feeding the world's population an adequate and healthy diet. As most of you know, today, a distressingly large share of the world's population is not adequately fed. Frighteningly, we don't even know how many. We have, frankly, quite low quality estimates of how many people go to bed any given night consuming inadequate calories to sustain their body mass the next day. But that's actually a small share of the people who suffer food insecurity because the bigger problems come from obesity with its associated problems with chronic disease and especially for micronutrient deprivation, insufficient intake of critical minerals and vitamins, which are especially threatening to the youngest, to children in utero, to relatively young children in what's commonly thought of as the first thousand days from conception through a second birthday, when limits on mineral and vitamin intake severely hamper organ development, not least of which the brain, and permanently impede the capabilities of humans because if your organs don't develop, your brain doesn't develop, your God-given potential is never fully realized. So food security challenges are already a very real, very significant problem in the world. And there's a real risk that they'll get worse. And the reason for that is as follows. We're gonna see an appreciable increase in food demand in the world. And I'm gonna tell you in a moment, there's very little we can do to stem this increase. These are relatively coarse estimates, but the best estimates are that between now and 2050, we're gonna need something on the order of 70 to 100% increase in aggregate production of food, measured in calorie terms, but that brings along with it lots of minerals and vitamins. The main reasons for that are, are three primary drivers. First is population growth, which as the Pope argues in Laudate Si, is not really the big driver of environmental degradation. But it is a big driver of increasing food demand because every person needs to consume a minimum amount of nutrients. There's relatively little we can do to reduce population growth, at least not without engaging in some ethically fraught activities on the Chinese or Romanian models. So we're gonna see two to three billion more people on the face of the earth over the next 30 or 40 years. In places where I work in Sub-Saharan Africa, the median age is in the teens. Right now, Sub-Saharan Africans' median age is 18. You can't do much to limit population growth when half the population is just entering childbearing years. So we are inevitably going to see appreciable population growth, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, to a lesser degree in Asia. The second driver is urbanization. The world relatively recently moved to 50% urban, and it's going to become increasingly urban. And as we urbanize, we extend the food supply chain. And as we extend the food supply chain, that transforms the foods we need. It increases loss because you engage in more processing, natural loss along the supply chain, et cetera. And the third and biggest reason is income growth. And we should celebrate this. 
This is a problem we should be delighted to be facing because the world's poor need higher incomes to be able to lead fulfilling lives. But we also know that the poor spend a much larger share of the every marginal dollar they gain on food than do you and I. And as a result, we see about five to eight times the impact of income growth in poor countries, which are growing much faster on average than wealthier countries. We see about five to eight times the impact on food demand at the margin than we do from income growth in Europe or North America. So the result is that we're gonna see a rather striking increase in aggregate demand for food within most of our lifetimes. And most of that will be concentrated in Africa and Asia, where the income growths are fastest and population growth is largest. The implication of that is pretty profound because we can't do much to stem that. You'll hear lots of people talk about tremendous rates of food waste. The numbers behind food waste estimates are, are very shaky at best. Uh, moreover, any good economist will tell you that the optimal rate of food waste is positive, sometimes relatively high because it's costly to try to prevent waste. And as a result, we see, for example, farmers routinely choosing to leave crops in the field or to not store everything hermetically. So we find that the likelihood of reducing food waste by the kind of figures you sometimes hear in the press is just very unlikely. Movements to eliminate animal source foods and diets to become a vegetarian society, likewise, highly unlikely. We can get a little bit of behavioral nudges to change diets, but we're not gonna see major changes that come through any of the sorts of demand side interventions that you hear people promote we will see a very sharp increase in demand. So we have to increase supply to match it. There's no other alternative. And there are three ways in which you can increase supply of food. The first is you can expand the use of inputs, what we economists call extensification, expanding at the extensive margin the production frontier. And the main way that people think about doing that is through physical expansion of agriculture, bringing more land into cultivation, or in the case of capture fisheries, a broader range of ocean, a broader range of marine resources we capture. The opportunities for extensification are increasingly limited because in much of the world, we simply don't have much available arable land left to cultivate. Asia is essentially out of cultivable land now. There's much land available in Sub-Saharan Africa. Africa is home to about two thirds of the arable land that's not presently cultivated, but most of the water is not readily available there. So either land or water are limiting throughout most of the world right now. Our capacity to expand the agricultural frontier is actually fairly limited. The competition for land is growing more ferocious as we see expansion of protected areas for biodiversity conservation, and especially as we see expansion of cities and peri-urban residential areas and commercial areas. So that the likelihood that we will be able to meet the growth in food demand through expansion of the agricultural frontier is rather low that's gonna account for relatively limited, limited amount of supply growth. Climate change makes the challenge all the more daunting, not least to which because agriculture already accounts for the overwhelming majority of water use in the areas where food demand growth will be greatest. In Asia and Africa, you see 70% in excess of 80% in most of Sub-Saharan Africa of freshwater resources already go into agriculture. There's just not much room to expand your use of water. So the, the, the opportunity for extensification-based supply growth is going to be sharply limited. Here are just a couple of simple maps to give you some examples of this. The key thing to take away from this is that the blue areas of the world are the areas where water is relatively plentiful. We're not anywhere close right now to maxing out on water use for agriculture. But if you look carefully at what parts of the world we see are in blue, you notice they don't map very well to the places that we're going to see significant expansion of food demand. The Americas have relatively plentiful water. Northern Europe, relatively plentiful water. Relative to population base and cultivation, much of Australia, believe it or not, has relatively plentiful water. But these don't map well to the places where we need to grow food production. As I'll show you shortly, you have something on the order of 85 to 90% of food is consumed in the country in which it's grown. Trade is incredibly important at the margin, but food is the ultimate local economy resource. 
that we see most food does not travel very far. It stays within the country in which it's cultivated due to perishability or low value to weight that makes transport, storage, et cetera, relatively cost ineffective. So water is gonna be the crucial limiting factor and climate change is going to impose some pretty severe additional constraints on that. As we see from the World Bank's estimate depicted here, the places likely to face the most serious challenges due to climate change are likewise in the, the areas where we see population growth and food demand growth uh, and income growth most likely to accelerate. So the second way in which we can increase output if we can't extensify much is just improve efficiency. So we don't expand input use, we just get more output per every unit input. But we're at the home of the belief in efficiency. Uh, Ted Schultz in particular, who I'll quote again later as I close, had a, had a long-standing argument with a number of other economists focused on smallholder agriculture that small farmers in Africa and Asia were poor but efficient. And his hypothesis has largely been, been borne out as we've developed better methods of collecting data and of estimating how well people produce relative to their production possibility frontier. Smallholder inefficiency is much smaller than some people believe and it's largely random and driven by exogenous events, climate, pests, etc. The true extent of post-harvest loss, as I mentioned, we don't really know. Some people will point to something called the inverse farm size relationship, the observation that small farms get higher productivity per unit cultivated, but that's the mechanisms behind that don't lend themselves to squeezing efficiency out of that. So efficiency improvement using the exact same technologies and the same inputs is unlikely to deliver much. That leaves us one path. And this is where I will quarrel a bit with Ladato C and some of those who've interpreted it. We simply have no choice but to improve technologies. And we have an excellent track record. Some of this talk may sound rather depressing, the numbers of people who are hungry, the challenges we face, but we've been in this situation before. Some of you will recall the population bomb and the, the dire prognostications we faced in the late 60s and early 70s, especially during the 1973-74 world food price crisis which we saw repeated again just a few years ago, when people thought population growth was gonna to lead to mass starvation. But the Green Revolution, a technology-based set of interventions to improve agricultural productivity, especially in the developing world, saved by many people's estimates up to a billion lives by enabling us to cultivate more on the same land with the same water. We can do the same thing now the call now is for a doubly green revolution, one that is both environmentally conscious, especially paying attention to increasingly limited water, to soils degradation that is challenging parts of the world, phosphorus is in particular a real problem looming in sub-Saharan Africa, and we face some other problems too, social resistance to genetically modified organisms. We face resistance to uh, some IP protections where we're seeing gene grabs that aren't appreciably different from land grabs. We're seeing people who are marshalling intellectual property and impeding progress of others. The biggest challenge we face with a technology-based approach to addressing the food security challenge is that the productivity growth has to be primarily in Africa and Asia. And the R&D capacity in agriculture in Africa and Asia remains sharply limited. That's an important role for those of us who are based in universities, to help develop the scientists who can go back and help to develop R&D capacity and promote productivity growth, as well as to develop the technologies that are truly generalizable, that extend beyond just our local backyard. And this is where I have the quarrel with Laudate Si and some of the commentators on it, who will emphasize the technocratic paradigm as being an obstacle, as part of the source of the problem of humanity's relationship with Mother Earth. I, on the contrary, think that there is no path to resolving the problems we face, especially the challenges of feeding the world's poor adequately, unless we embrace technological change. Not all technological change, but we simply must double down on technology and science. Again, most of the world's food gets consumed in the country in which it's eaten. This is a simple plot that just shows you aggregate global volumes of trade production and, uh, and food aid, the, the, the concessional transfers across countries. It's, you see a very steady pattern here. Even with very rapid expansion in food trade, food remains a highly localized commodity. So just to, to wrap up, 
increasing food availability is absolutely essential. It's a necessary condition, as Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate, pointed out to us in his famous work 35 years ago. It's not, an, it's not a sufficient condition, I emphasize. Other things are very important to make sure the world's for, poor are fed adequately. Access is key, social protection schemes, such as those seen in Latin America with which Pope Francis is intimately familiar. Those have done tremendous work in helping to feed the poor of Latin America over the last generation. I've already spoken of micronutrient deficiencies. We've seen what we can do, for example, by iodizing salt. We've reduced by almost 85% over the last 30 years the number of people suffering from mental retardation. The single biggest cause of underdeveloped cognitive capacity in children in the world used to be iodine deficiency. It is no longer, thanks to a very simple technology of iodizing salt. You and I take it for granted. 150 years ago in this country, that was a real problem too. We can solve these problems, but they do take technologies. Let me just close by recalling the opening two sentences of Ted Schultz's Nobel Prize acceptance speech from 1979. For those who don't know, Ted Schultz was a, a legendary development and agricultural economist who spent most of his career here at Chicago. He wrote, most of the people in the world are poor, so if we knew the economics of being poor, we would know much of the economics that really matters. Most of the world's poor people earn their living from agriculture, so if we knew the economics of agriculture, we would know much of the economics of being poor. Agriculture is the sector where nature and humanity meet most intimately. The relationship is compromised. We face a big challenge, but we have the capacity to solve it. It will take the concerted effort of scientists across great universities and research laboratories to solve that problem. We're on our way, but we do need additional attention to these things. I hope very much that Laudate Si will help to focus more attention on this among Catholics and much more broadly. And I look forward to the discussion we'll have today and tomorrow. I especially look forward to hearing the other panelists' remarks. And I thank you for your time and interest. Thank you so much. Thank you to the conference organizers, Lumen Christi, to Tom Donnelly, who had something to do with this, and my friend Ted Brisky. Um, International House is a wonderful setting, and we thank you for that. And uh, Archbishop, we need to replicate you around the country <laughs> to give more of these talks, obviously. Um, but thank you to my fellow panelists, who I will uh, learn from, I'm sure. Um, I've been speaking, as many of us, on the encyclical in a lot of different uh, settings, but in particular, uh, I just wanted to mention Yale last year, even before the encyclical came out, our dean, who's a paleobotanist and a, a tremendous um, scholar, uh, wanted us to do a panel on the encyclical even before it came out. And uh, I think that's the level of interest uh, even in secular academia. Um, so, and I've just... Um, returned from Iran uh, about two weeks ago where the government of Iran, the Department of, of the Environment, had a conference that was following up on two other conferences that they had organized in 2001 and 2005 under Hatami that my husband and I went to as well on religion and ecology. Um, and the concern in that part of the world, as Hatami said very emphatically, uh, we're far less concerned about terrorism than the environment, because we live in a desert, and there was only water eight hours a day in Tehran, and, and the uh, river in Isfahan had completely dried up in 2005 when we were there. Um, this conference and the others were sponsored by UNEP, uh, United Nations Environment Program, and UNESCO, um, trying to reach out to uh, a very educated public in Iran. Uh, the Minister for the Environment is a woman, the Vice President of the country also, Ebtekar, and she's the one who helped organize these conferences. So w one of the things I want to do in this presentation, I think the, are the slides here, yeah, um, is suggest that this encyclical comes into a very large international set of concerns of which uh, Professor Ramanatha has been dealing with for many years, including since the 70s in his studies on climate change. So I just want to 
um, expand on this a little bit. So we've got climate change awareness growing, but we still need action. We've got biodiversity loss. We're in a sixth extinction period, the most massive loss on species since the end of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Um, we have these species literally um, disappearing before our eyes. Um, that sense also of pollution, of waste around the world. The rivers uh, of India are beyond recognition, including when this Yamuna River, when I went there 40 years ago, nothing like this. And people cannot sustain 50 million people in the Gangetic Plain in, in uh, India. So these problems are massive. The science community has been making us aware of it for a very long time. Uh, a number of them are familiar to you. Ed Wilson, I mentioned Peter Crane, our dean, Jane Lopchenko, an extraordinary uh, leader, Ursula Goodenough, Tom Lovejoy, especially s some of these on issues of biodiversity loss, which is still almost an invisible problem um, to most people, especially in the U.S. Um, so. This encyclical then begins what is happening to our common home, the state of the world, um, as I've just mentioned, and says that we have to have this scientific understanding of widespread environmental degradation uh, and poverty, this linking of these issues. Um, so the natural science, but all the social science that has been going on in policy, in law, in economics. Gus Beth, our past dean, founded the Natural Resources Defense uh, Program. The lawyers, the international lawyers, have been working on this for a very long time. And clearly, as the theme here um, would suggest, there's a whole movement in economics, especially um, by Richard Norgard, who was a founder of ecological economics. There's a whole range, of course, of spectrums, as we've heard about economics. But I would suggest we need to move into conversation with many of these people and many of the disciplines to extend the message of Laudato Si. Um, <clears throat> So the human roots of the ecological crisis, this analysis that economic growth and progress without limits is absolutely at the heart of this problem. Um, that market capitalism and tech, the technocratic paradigm that's just been mentioned with qualifications, but these are very severe um, critiques in the encyclical of capitalism without restraints, of a capitalism driving us over the edge of unsustainability. Um, the excessive anthropocentrism, is this all about us? What about future generations of all species? Uh, the notion of nature as a dead object. You know, I could say one word here if we're talking about Catholic social teachings in the environment. If we have a sensibility in this tradition of the incarnation, of a logos throughout the, the entire evolutionary process. How could we be doing what we are doing? It is a scandal. Because as Teilhard de Chardin said, this is a divine milieu. We are destroying not just the, a created order. We are destroying a sense of the divine. That is the level on which this is so crucial. So. I'll say something more in a moment about workers, but I want to say Thomas Berry, some of you may know his name. He was one of the very first to recognize this over 40 years ago, that we have ethics for homicide and suicide, but not for biocide and, and geocide. That is what we need to do within ethics department, within theology departments, and so on. We have got to rev it up. Jamie Schaefer will talk about this tomorrow. We are inadequate for the ethics that are ahead of us. Um, so leveraging moral transformation, I would say we need to be attentive to those working in secular environmental ethics. Aldo Leopold was a graduate of our school at Yale. He had a land ethic. It's magnificent and has a tremendous spiritual sensibility too. We've got the world's religions coming on board in this issue. And the encyclical is the leaven that will bring this to another level with the call for ecological conversion of all peoples everywhere. Now, 
we can also recognize, and I think we have to have humility here, there's problems with religions, and we know that, but there's tremendous promise for this leaven, for this transformation, these large numbers of people, the um, sense of moral and institutional power. This is why many of the scientists at Yale welcome this uh, joining with the encyclical. So what we've been trying to do for the last 20 years is create a field of study as well as a force in the larger society. Let me just say a few words about that. 20 years ago at Harvard, we had three years of studies with 800 scholars from all over the world to say what is it that the views of nature, the practices and so on, the scriptural references, what are these views in relation to nature? How can we retrieve them and reevaluate them for our own purposes today and reconstruct a, a constructive theology, if you will? Um, there's a series of books that came out of that. The series on Christianity is very robust, including, of course, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, Evangelical. Every tradition had that range of representation. We established this forum on religion and ecology, moved it to Yale 10 years ago, and we're about to celebrate at Harvard in the fall, the 20th anniversary uh, of this work. We have a large website we invite you to take a look at. Uh, many resources for uh, educators and so on. We've been working um, on religion and climate change with a conference in 2001 and a publication on that topic. Uh, but many conferences, as you know, are, are now taking place nationally and internationally on religion and ecology around climate change. Now, in terms then of this field, the education, right here in in Chicago at Loyola, as you're probably aware, um, there's, I just met with Nancy Tuckman uh, an hour ago. She's a scientist there, and she has been leading an amazing project called Healing Earth, which is putting online these major problems of the environment, but with an ethical uh, take as well. It's a tremendous uh, program bringing the Jesuits colleges and universities, 2,500 high schools around the world, 175 colleges. This is an amazing force for change uh, within the educational system of the Jesuits. Um, the force on the ground. I don't know if any of you were at the climate march in New York uh, two years ago. 400,000 people. Anybody there? It was an amazing event. I'm a New Yorker. It was extraordinary. But it also marked this moment when 10,000 religious leaders and lay people were actively present uh, and charged. And that evening at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, an incredible celebration of what is the moral, uh, ethical power here to bring to bear in conjunction with science uh, and economics. So this growing movement, it certainly is interfaith with green faith and so on. The Catholic Climate Covenant, you may be fully aware of. There's also Franciscan Action Network. These are people on the ground trying to help change parishes, uh, movements, and so on. The interfaith power and light is quite widespread across the country. 40 states have it now. Um, but the other world's religions, including Thich Nhat Hanh, great leader of Buddhism, um, the woman below is a, a Buddhist nun in Taiwan doing remarkable things on ecology and justice. Catherine Jeffers Shorey, the last head of the Episcopal Church, a scientist and a leader in the environment, Joel Hunter, an evangelical. So we have many partners in this, uh, and some of them working for a long time. The Pope then comes into a two and three decade long movement of a field and a force. That is the beauty here. Something has been planted. The seeds are ready to grow. Um, so we also have, as, as Bishop, Archbishop Wensky said, we have precedents. Um, John Paul said um, in his encyclical, uh, celebrating uh, Leo's rerum novarum. We need to move from dominion to stewardship and cooperative labor. We are moving. This is the exciting thing. Um, Benedict, again, as, as we've heard, was a green pope. Um, 
And he had this notion, the duty to the poor, responsibility to future generations, the wise use of nature, the grammar of nature, which Thomas Berry described. Nature is not a collection of objects, but a communion of subjects. This is the interiority of nature itself. Um, one of the best friends, as you may know, of the Pope is the patriarch Bartholomew of the Orthodox Church. And this influence on the encyclical, I think, really needs to be underscored. Sorry. Um, the patriarch, since 1995, has done about eight symposiums on water. Uh, we went on about five of them. Extraordinary, profound theological reflection and policy reflection, largely in the international community of UN people, European ministers, and so on, but also um, in, in Alaska and in the Amazon. And in the Amazon, the patriarch, sorry, apologized to native peoples for what had happened with Christianity in that area. As you know, the Pope has done the same in Bolivia and elsewhere. Um, one of the great theologians of the Orthodox Church is John uh, Zazulus, or John of Pergamon. Um, he has this profound sense of the earth as icon, as a luminous revelation of the divine. Now, who was at the Vatican on June 18th when the encyclical was released? John Zazulus, because of the strong influence and friendship and interreligious dialogue that the Pope and the Patriarch um, are involved in. And the second chapter of the encyclical illustrates not just the problems, but the promise of creation with this mystery of the universe, with harmony, uh, with the interdependence of life, with a universal communion. So the natural environment is a collective good, the patrimony of all humanity. This is a patrimony. Just as universities like Chicago, museums like the Field Museum, the Art Institute, this is a patrimony for all humanity. Where are we in the religious communities with these issues? The, <clears throat> sorry, as well, at, on June 18th, I'm sure you're all familiar with Cardinal Turkson working very, very hard on the encyclical, um, both in its preparation and now in its bringing out from Ghana, um, and his, seems to be jumping. His sense of the more, uh, directing the Council for Justice and Peace at the Vatican, the moral imperative of all peoples is to be protectors of the environment. Care for creation is a virtue in its own right. There's a need for a new global solidarity uh, to direct our search for the common good. The power of the idea of a common good in a fragmented world is extraordinary and cannot be underestimated. And in universities that have deconstructed themselves out of meaning for the last number of decades, this is a huge call to constructive common good. Um, the other person who was there representing the science community, the head of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Studies, um, Shell Neuberger, along with our distinguished scientists right here, have been two of the leading scientists helping the Vatican on these issues. So we had, at that moment, the Pope wasn't there. We had a Greek Orthodox theologian, we had a cardinal from Africa, and we had a scientist. This is tremendous. This is world-breaking inter-religious, uh, if you will, but also reaching to the sciences. Now, I also want to give a special note of Leonardo Boff, who for many years as a liberation theologian uh, in Latin America was talking and was influenced by Thomas Berry to say, we need to bring together ecology and justice. Thomas Berry said to Boff many years ago, you can't have justice for people without a healthy community of life. The well-being of people and planet are deeply intertwined. So Boff actually was part of this ecology and justice series that we've been editing for 20 years. 
um, toward an integral ecology. His book, The Cry of the Earth, The Cry of the Poor, published at least a dozen years ago, was essential for the rethinking this coming together of people and the planet, ecology and justice. So integral ecology then brings ecology, economics, and equity together, this principle of the common good, solidarity with the poor, intergenerational justice, so that Catholic social teaching is finally expanded to include the earth. This is revolutionary, absolutely revolutionary, because years ago, I had people, including some Jesuits, say to me, the environment, wilderness, whitewater rafting, nothing to do with the issues of the poor, what we care about. This has got to be re-knit together, people and planet, absolutely crucial. So we've talked a bit about dialogue. Archbishop mentioned this already. Um, the interdisciplinary and interreligious coming together uh, in chapter five, and this new synthesis that the Pope calls for um, in his last chapter, new lifestyles, a covenant between humanity and nature. Very ancient biblical idea, but profoundly new. This notion of ecological conversion needs to be underscored again and again, because it's an appeal to people around the world, not just Catholics or Christians. Um, but this, that authentic humanity is calling for a new synthesis. I would say we are desperate for a new synthesis, especially of science and religion, of science and meaning. We can't live in a universe that's handed to us as meaningless, purposeless, that life is random or an accident, have a nice day. We have got to integrate where we belong in this vast unfolding process. And that is part of the synthesis that the Pope is calling for. So the scaling up then, billion Catholics, two billion Christians, other religious communities coming on board. The goals of the encyclical, the first one's already been realized. There's no doubt, and very influential Yale faculty, when he came back from the COP meeting, he held up the uh, encyclical and said, this made the difference in Paris. This made the difference. Um, I'll wrap up, yes, sorry. Francis of Assisi, uh, a key figure clearly in this. I won't go through this. Teilhard de Chardin, I want to underscore, mentioned in it. Thomas Berry, I've already spoken about. Um, and this film that we've done on Journey of the Universe. Last quote from Albert Einstein. A human being is part of a whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. I think that is the call of the encyclical. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Okay, um, <clears throat> I just want to say thanks for the opportunity uh, to participate in this important discussion. Uh, it falls out of the Pope's encyclical and uh, today out of the fabulous set of discussants we have here. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and make some contribution to it. I think we need a little slide transformation here. There we go, okay. So I'm gonna make uh, basically uh, I'll make several points here, but maybe there's two broad themes that I just want to rise to the front first. Uh, the first is uh, energy and environment are critical to human well-being, uh, and they're intertwined in really kind of interesting and unique ways, and it's very difficult to think about one uh, without the other. And I, but I think they come together in what I call the global energy challenge. Uh, and then the second, to be slightly controversial, uh, I think economics uh, can be an important part of ethics. At the University of Chicago, we don't 
view that as controversial, but I'm not sure everyone else agrees with the University of Chicago on that. Uh, and I'll try and talk uh, about how economics, I think, can be an important part of solving uh, this critical and complicated set of thorny issues. All right, so this picture, I think, uh, perfectly encapsulates or captures what I think are the three legs of the stool of the global energy challenge. Uh, so this is a picture from Beijing from a couple of years ago. Uh, from anyone who's, uh, for those of you who've been to China, you'll maybe recognize it. But uh, let me just go through what I think are the three legs of the energy stool and how they're all, uh, uh, the global energy challenge and how they're all captured here. So the first is you can very viscerally feel the motion there uh, and the action. And it so well captures what China has accomplished in the last 25 years, which is an almost unprecedented increase uh, in human living standards. They've literally brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Uh, and you can see it there. The guy in the cab, it wasn't that long ago that he was probably on a bike. Uh, and it's not going to be that long until the guy on the bike uh, is going to be in a car. Uh, so energy, and the point I want to make is energy is at the center of that. That would not have been achievable without energy. Uh, and that energy means lots of energy consumption. So that's the first leg of the stool. How do we have access to reliable and inexpensive uh, sources of energy to power the improvement of living standards that are so vital for bringing people uh, out of uh, complicated lives of poverty? The second leg of the stool uh, is also visible, maybe even more visible than the visceral sense of movement and energy there. And that's in, it's in the middle of the day, and you can't see the sun. Uh, and for people who have been to China, you know that you can go days without seeing the sun. And why can't you see the sun? You can't see the sun for the very same, the, the energy that is powering that economic growth is also causing air pollution. Uh, and that air pollution is hiding the sun. Uh, and not only that, that air pollution is causing all kinds, it's unpleasant to look at, but it's also causing all kinds of health problems. And our friend there on the bike is very aware of it. He's got the goggles on, he's got the face mask, and in his own way, he's trying to protect himself from that. So the second leg of the stool is how can you get all this energy consumption that's vital and urgent uh, without having environmental health problems uh, attached to it. And the third leg of the global energy challenge stool that uh, I think is also embedded in the picture, although is not quite as transparent, is you know deep down that the same energy that's causing economic growth and is causing air pollution is also uh, involves the release of CO2, uh, and that's causing climate change. And so the third leg is how can you have uh, the energy you need, the, the economic growth you need, without uh, on, uh, setting off disruptive climate change. And a thesis here will be that it's very hard, maybe in many cases it's impossible, to find policies or actions or behavioral changes that achieve all three of those legs of the stool. But we should be keeping all three of those legs uh, at the forefront of our mind. So just to get our uh, facts straight here, uh, I love data. Data is often extraordinarily disappointing. Just when you think it's going to tell you something, it tells you something else. I brought this graph up because that's a counterpoint uh, to that. And what this graph has on the x-axis uh, is GDP per capita, so measure of people's living standards. And on the y-axis, it has energy consumption. And there's an incredibly tight relationship. And all I want you to take away from it is we do not have historical, we, we do not have historical examples uh, of countries achieving high living standards without using lots and lots of energy. So that's, that's the only thing I want you to take away from that. Energy is critical for growth. Now, a challenge is lots of places in the world do not have so much energy currently. Uh, and uh, I find this, uh, while, while true, also very striking. Here, this is per capita electricity consumption in several parts of the world. I start with the United States. You can see uh, uh, the average consumption that all of us enjoy uh, is about 13,000 kilowatt hours per person per year. China, home to you know, 1.3, 1.4 billion people is about a quarter of that, maybe 3,300. China, uh, India is about another quarter, and the number is a couple years old, so maybe it's 700 or 800 now. Uh, the average person in India only consumes 700 or 800 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. 
Bihar, many of you don't know where Bihar is, it's a state in India, home to 100 million people, a third of the U.S. population. Average electricity consumption there is about 100 kilowatt hours uh, per person per year. So the poverty that makes lives complicated, makes lives shorter, makes lives difficult, uh, is reflected in these numbers. And energy access has got to be at the front of any uh, let's, I, I, as an economist, maybe I'm not uh, equipped to talk about morals, but it's got to be at the part of driving a lot of uh, what will be causing change in the world. Now, the next slide is somewhat, uh, I think, will help to underscore the friction in the global energy challenge. This is just from the United States, but it's true, uh, it's true around the world. So we're going to probably have lots and lots of increase in energy consumption. Those guys in Bihar are not going to be excited about continuing to live with 100 kilowatt hours per year. Well, how, where are they going to go get it? Uh, well, the way we make our energy choices currently is we largely choose them on how expensive it is. Uh, and what this figure underscores is the cost per producing one kilowatt hour of electricity from several different technologies. Uh, and what you'll notice right away is that the least expensive technologies, uh, coal, uh, natural, a new natural gas plant or a new coal plant, are all much less expensive uh, than the low carbon energy sources. Uh, and you know, maybe in some cases uh, a quarter of the cost or a half of the cost. And so where are the guys who have very low levels of energy consumption, where are the people with high levels of energy consumption for that matter in the US going to look for more energy? The economics, at least as we choose our energy currently, and I'll come back to that, point to choosing fossil fuels. Uh, and the fossil fuels are challenging. Uh, for two primary reasons. And the first, which I think people instinctively know from that picture of China, is that they cause pollution that leads to shorter uh, and sicker lives. And we saw that in the picture. Uh, and here's some measures, uh, concentrations of particulate matter, uh, PM 2.5, uh, around the world in some key cities. Uh, we, so you can see in many parts of the US, even the parts that are thought to be more polluted, you have very low levels of particulate matter concentrations. Uh, and in other parts of the world, uh, you have much higher ones. And then let's just note the ones where it's higher also tend to be the places uh, where people are, are, are poorer currently. Uh, so one question, and I'm, I'm afraid I don't want to eat into the rest of the time too much, so I, I'll, I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, but one thing I tried to do in my research was to set out and figure, well, how bad is it to live with very high levels of air pollution? What are the consequences of that? Uh, and to do that, uh, I studied, uh, chi uh, China seemed like an, a great place to study, partially because they have such high concentrations of pollution, and it's reflective of the high concentrations of pollution that many hundreds of millions of people in developing countries currently face. And to do this, I exploited a very arbitrary rule that China established in the 1950s, and it's reflected in that blue line on the picture. And that arbitrary rule, which comes from the planning period when China was not nearly as wealthy as it is today, but the rule continues to apply today, is, well, we don't have enough money to provide winter heating for everybody in the country, so we can provide it for maybe half of the country, and we're just going to draw a line across the middle of, that, uh, of the country. And if you live to the north, you get winter heating, free coal, and boilers for free. And if you live to the south, you were forbidden from having heating. There just weren't enough resources for that. Uh, and what this, the idea of this research project was, was to say, well, this might give us, uh, this was also a period where there was not a lot of migration in China, this might give us something approximating an experiment, or a natural experiment, of what are the consequences of long-run exposure to very high levels uh, of air pollution. Uh, and that's because the free uh, winter heating came with the use of coal that was largely uh, unconstrained. And the first finding of this uh, is so the zero line there is places that are north of the river, uh, and the place uh, and to the left, your left uh, is places that are south of the river. And so the unintended consequence of this policy that aimed to provide winter heating and did provide winter heating was it also came bundled with extraordinary increases in air pollution right to the north of the river relative uh, to the south of the river. Uh, and you can see it's about 50% higher. And just to go back to that, 
Uh, this line is, you know, uh, right above here is where uh, there was a free winter heating, and right below there was none. And what this figure is trying to tell you is that those places uh, to the north had much higher levels of air pollution. So I saw that and I thought, well, this might be an opportunity to answer this question people have long been interested in. What is the effect of long run and sustained exposure? And so you should be able to guess what's the next figure I'm going to put up. It's a life expectancy. Uh, and if pollution is bad for life expectancy, you should expect there to be a mirror image there. Uh, and indeed, this is a rare, another instance where data was not uh, I mean, it's disappointing as a human, but it was not disappointing in terms of test uh, 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 one's hypothesis. And here, what you can see is that right at the river's edge, the same places uh, that people had were exposed to high levels of air pollution, and they were the intended beneficiaries of this policy. They actually experienced reductions in life expectancy on average of about four years. Uh, it's entirely concentrated in elevated rates of mortality due to cardiorespiratory diseases. It's not due to other things that are uh, un unrelated to air pollution. Uh, and it is apparent throughout the life cycle. It's apparent for, uh, you see, elevated rates of mortality uh, for the young and uh, for the old. So this use of fossil fuels uh, that produces particulate matter uh, really has quite devastating, it can have quite devastating impacts on human well-being. If China were to comply with China's own standards uh, for uh, what are allowable levels of particulate matter concentrations, they would be able to increase uh, the number of life years that their people, the citizens of China have, or would they be expected to live by about two and a half billion years. If you did the same exercise for India, it's more than two billion as well. This is really quite dramatic increases. So that was the second leg of the stool in a little more detail. The third leg of the stool uh, is that fossil fuels cause climate change. Uh, and I thought it might be useful to just ask ourselves, well, what could we actually, what can we expect with respect to how much, how many fossil fuels does the planet have uh, to offer? Uh, and the, what I'm going to show here is the, it's, uh, the climate science, the economists talk in very complicated ways. Uh, in a complicated language. I think the climate scientists are even worse. Uh, they like to talk about gigatons of CO2. I don't really understand what that is. Uh, and as someone who uh, was con continually tortured by my grade school teachers that we were soon going to switch to Celsius, uh, but we never did, I still don't quite understand what a degree Celsius is. Uh, and so what I've done here is plot, well, how much warming is available to, the, to us through, or not available in the good way, but available by if we were to use all the fossil fuels. And so what you can see here is that the first shape, and I'm going to add a couple more here, is that we've baked 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit into the system. That's done. That's uh, based on all the fossil fuels we've used since the Industrial Revolution. We've guaranteed ourselves uh, 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit uh, change in temperature. If we were to use all the coal, oil, and natural gas that the energy industry, they have a funny concept, but that the energy industry calls proven reserves, those are fossil fuels that we know where they are, we can get them with our current technologies, and we can get them with our current technologies at today's market prices. That's about another 2.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they have another category they call resources. Resources are we know it's there, uh, we can get it with current technologies, we just need the price to be higher. Uh, that's an extra three degrees Fahrenheit, and that's just from oil and gas. And then you'll notice that there's a big space missing there, and you might say, well, wait, wait, fossil fuels, we've got our oil, we've got our gas, and what's the third? We have our coal, and there's coal everywhere. Uh, and so if we were to use all of this, uh, we have like 16 degrees of warming that's available to us. Uh, it's uh, kind of an astounding change in what the planet would look like and feel like and would affect human well-being in, uh, in ways that are difficult to imagine. Um, full stop. So if we don't want to do all that, uh, where are the reductions in carbon emissions going to have to come from? Uh, and so here what I've put is uh, I've grouped China and India. It's not completely fair, but it's just there's only so much room you can have on a chart. And this is the source of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, from the United States, from the Industrial Revolution to today, and then for China and India. And you can see the United States accounts for about 22 percent, 
China and India account for about 16 percent. And obviously, we only have 300 million people. Those countries are much larger. We have a quite disproportionate share. But what I want you to pay attention to is that if we were to follow kind of a business as usual scenario, these numbers begin to change very dramatically. And so by 2050, China and India will account for about 30 percent. Uh, the United States will be down to 16 percent. And by the end of the century, uh, it's even more, uh, their share is even more. And what that's, that's, what that's trying to say is without passing any judgment uh, on who should pay for this, is that wherever you want to get the reductions in CO2 from, they're going to, a lot of them are going to have to run through those countries. Uh, and so someone's going to have to pay for that. As I showed you, the fossil fuels are cheaper. It's more expensive uh, to use uh, uh, low carbon energy sources. And the challenge, coming back to our guy on the bike, is effectively the world will be asking the countries who have the lowest or lower levels of income to bear a lot of the burden of this, unless we're going to get in the business of shipping lots of resources uh, to those countries. And that's part of the energy challenge. Uh, you know, these are the kinds of things that people see all the time. This is the distribution of the number of days in a year that the average Indian faces in different ranges of temperature. The only thing I want you to see is that there'll be a huge rightward shift in that, uh, and a big, big piling up uh, of uh, at, at the very hottest days, where a lot of the crop problems reside, where a lot of human health problems reside, uh, and it just underscores uh, the challenge that climate has. Um, so now. Okay, at this point, my wife is like always staring at me like, do you have to be so depressing? Uh, and so let me try to uh, now pull us out a little bit of that. So the first thing I'll just say is that the Paris Agreement, a voluntary agreement, but if everyone were to uh, follow through on their pledges, uh, is a real step forward. Uh, and you can see that here. This is the scenario of... Uh, emissions and temperature change that we would have been on in business as usual. Uh, this is a two degree C path that a lot of climate scientists recommend. And this is more or less uh, what was agreed to uh, at Paris. So, you know, you can view it as half empty or half full. I, I, I'd say that that's half full. Um, so that's progress. And now let me talk about, uh, you know, in uh, the, the gall of an economist to talk about ethics and how economics can be part of that, let me now talk about that. Uh, so I think there's a couple solutions that we have at hand. Uh, the first is, uh, this is the, uh, you know, this is the go-to for an economist, which is, man, we should really get prices right. Uh, and so let's talk about what it would mean to get energy prices right. I'm not going to talk about this in great detail. Let's just say my own view is that part of the energy access problem in the developing world revolves around the fact that energy is treated as a right, not as a private good. Uh, I, th I think given the time, I shouldn't go into greater detail. Uh, the second pricing problem that we have is that energy subsidies are a major problem in many parts of the world. They lead to inefficient use of energy. And the rub is they don't actually benefit the poor. Uh, they benefit uh, the wealthy and anything that subsidizes, uh, you know, the wealthy consume more of everything, so I, uh, that should not be terribly surprising. Uh, and the third, and this is where I want to stop and focus our attention for a minute, and we looked at this a few minutes ago, uh, is, as I said, we choose our energy currently largely based on what is the price of producing it. Uh, and so this figure is trying to tell you we choose energy with this system, uh, we're going to lean towards the fossil fuels, uh, and, you, and there's lots of resistance to not. Uh, but what that misses is that the air pollution causes, that associated with fossil fuels is cause real damages, and the climate change is going to cause real damages, and those damages, both of those sets of damages can be monetized, can be put into dollar terms. Uh, and if one were to actually engage in a market system where those prices were, the damages were reflected in prices, that could be through carbon pricing, it could be through a cap and trade, it could be there's uh, through regulations, there's many ways to get there. Uh, the picture starts to change. And so what here what I've done is now supposed a carbon tax of $100 per ton. And what you can see is that suddenly changes the way that picture looks. Coal no longer looks like the irresistible force. Uh, natural gas uh, really looks like a winner, which has half the content, uh, uh, carbon content of coal. 
Uh, new nuclear plants, which are completely out of the money in the current system, suddenly look like uh, they might have a role to play. Uh, and I, I, I'll just say, I, I think we don't have time to go into this, but uh, what that underscores is that a critical question that we don't know a lot about is, well, what is the right monetized value of a release of an extra ton of CO2, which economists like to call the social cost of carbon? Uh, we have some models available. Uh, I think they are not, uh, they're, they, they're kind of like the quote about democracy, they're the best thing we got, but uh, there are some challenges with them. Uh, and uh, I just want to underscore that there's some exciting research, full disclosure, that I'm involved in that is trying to develop more reliable numbers so that one would have a sense of if we were to engage in pricing and have prices reflect uh, the damages, uh, where would we uh, end up? Uh, and. Uh, I think we don't have time to cover this, but so that's solution one. It runs through prices. The second solution is I think we desperately need to invest in innovation. Uh, there's a clear market case for that. Many firms will not engage in, in uh, R&D that they cannot benefit from. Uh, and uh, one thing I want to underscore is that right now there's lots of investment in innovation, but it's, most of it's occurring in the fossil fuels. Uh, and that's because there's money to be made there. And so this is just a picture of what fracking does. Uh, and it has, you know, altered the uh, energy world. It's led to the basically 80 years of natural gas consumption to fall out of the sky, maybe 20 years of petroleum consumption to fall out of the sky. And that's all the time the low carbon energy sources are going to have to find ways uh, to beat those fossil fuels. Uh, there's also been a lot of progress in clean tech. Some of that's uh, visible here. Uh, and, but I just want to make the point that energy R&D investment uh, still remains relatively low. Uh, and to summarize, I think uh, there are two really kind of plain vanilla economic solutions, dare I say ethical solutions, uh, to the global energy challenge, which run through uh, pricing uh, and run through uh, energy R&D investment. And my own view is that, that those, what those two things can deliver are solutions to this very complicated and complex three-legged stool, which uh, we call the Global Energy Challenge. Thank you. The one uh, great advantage in going last is that everything that needs to be said has been said. So I have no pressure of saying anything profound to you. Uh, if I can have the first slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I, I want to thank uh, the Lumen Institute for inviting me. Uh, I taught here for four years. Uh, from 86 to 90, so it's just a great pleasure and privilege to come back to this campus. I'm also honored to be uh, in this distinguished panel. My, just listening to them, my creative juices are flowing. At my age, that's not that easy. What I wanted to talk to you today is that, you know, uh, we all know there is overwhelming scientific and uh, support, there is overwhelming support from policymakers and global leaders. I mean, the Paris Summit Agreement is a spectacular evidence for that support from all branches of uh, people who have been working on this. So you can ask, why is there still pessimism? What we need to do, take drastic actions. We already heard from uh, uh, Michael about that. I'll tell you one or two more. There is simply no public support for taking such drastic actions. I mean, not only in the US, worldwide. So we are sort of stuck. And there are support for incremental actions, but that's not enough, and I'll, I'll show you why. And what I want to propose to you is that we need an alliance between science, religion, and policy 
which can have a transformational effect. I am basing this uh, big claim based on some spectacular developments at the Vatican, uh, thanks to uh, Pope Francis, but also the previous uh, popes. And I, I not only had the privilege of having a small role in this, but I had the front seat witness, witnessing formation of this alliance, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, but I'm a climate scientist, so I, not, I need to start from my home base. Uh, I, I think we heard about an economist saying he will dare to speak about ethics. I'm a natural scientist, so it takes a lot more courage for me to talk about religion and uh, <laughs> policy makers. So the issue is, uh, uh, you know, as for scientists, any scientific idea, be it a theory or a hypothesis or empirically based, it's judged by the predictions it makes. As, but since the last 50 years, there have been several major predictions. And sadly, I have seen each of them coming true. And I just wanted to start with the one I was personally involved in. Uh, in 1980, I teamed up with a meteorologist and we looked at all of the data and said, if this carbon dioxide theory of climate change has any validity, when would we see that signal? And we made that prediction that we would see it by year 2000. Mind you, in 1980, the planet was still in the cooling trend. And, and that's when, as you know, 2001, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of over 1,000 scientists said they are seeing a discernible warming. That is the warming rising above the background noise. So where do we stand? You know, I was going to tell you about gigatons and uh, <laughs> just blew my five minutes talk away, so I'm not going to mention that. What I would say is that if we continue on this path, we would see the two degree warming in about 35 years from now. I had used a similar type of models to make this prediction about nine years ago. We already seen one degree warming. I'm using Celsius. I grew up in India where we use Celsius. So. And so you can ask, what is the two degree warming? When the planet reaches that, you know, the stock of gases, pollutants, we already dumped enough to warm the planet by two degrees. I'm certain of that. The question is when, and that's where I'm risking my neck and predicting it's going to be 35 years from now. When it reaches that, that would be a planet unlike any we have witnessed in the last one million years. No ecosystem, none of our glaciers, and none of our forests would have witnessed that climate in the last million years. So we don't even know what that planet is going to look like. I simply don't trust our models when we go beyond that. So uh, what do we do? Basically, what I call is we have to bend the curves. Everything is going up. Air pollution going up, our consumption. We need to bend that climate change curve. And there are two levers we have. One is to put the carbon dioxide lever, basically convert our economy based on renewable energies, our energy consumption. You know, solar, wind, nuclear, what, what, what do we have you? But what people ignore, this has been my work, is that there is another lever we have. Only 50% of the warming now is coming from carbon dioxide. This is unfortunately a well-kept secret amongst most not working in this area. The other 50% comes from pollutants like methane, black carbon, halocarbons, and others, and we know how to cut them down. For example, California has cut its short-lived climate pollutants, that's what I call them. Their lifetime is a week or 10 years, by 90%. So if we take the soot, 
which is about 2,000 times more potent than carbon dioxide, which comes from diesel combustion and biomass burning, they are gone a week from now. So if we cut these pollutants using just existing technologies, nothing fancy, but we should be willing to share with the rest of the world, we can cut down the rate of warming by half. That looks so promising, so you should ask me, why are you turning to religion? <laughs> I'll come to that next. So about 10 years ago, I realized because of our delay in acting actions, this has become a huge moral ethical problem. The first is intergenerational equity. That carbon dioxide, if you'll forgive me, we have put a trillion tons of carbon dioxide, which is there, that's going to stay for 100 years to 1,000 years. Already, our massive glaciers have started melting Antarctic, West Antarctic, and Greenland. That melting, if you go past two degrees, will continue for five to 10,000 years and bring the sea level up by about 300 feet. So we are taking decisions for generations unborn, and they're not at the table to tell us, please don't do that. Continue your standard of living, just switch your fuel, that's all. We just use economic reasons to claim it's too expensive. But what's the comparison for that expense? Have we thought about billions and billions of our own children, grandchildren who are going to be born? The second is what I call intergeneration equity. About 60% of the climate pollution is just coming from one billion of us. And there is a, what I call bottom three billion who have no access to that fossil fuel or can't afford it. We know we'll suffer the worst consequences because they're all farmers. We heard from Barrett about that, okay? So I basically, I spent my sabbatical living in villages. I grew up in a village in India, so that's why I come back to this problem. The world, there are two worlds. One world inhibited by the top one billion with unlimited access to fossil fuels. And then the bottom three billion, I used to be the house guest of that woman, she in Himalayas. They simply burn firewood and dung, even for cooking. So we have left three billion people behind. And we know the sort of drought which California had four years, that will be enough to wipe them out. What will happen? The men go to cities, live in slums, and the women and girls are reduced to whatever they can do to survive. Slavery, trafficking, these are things uh, the Laudato C talks about. So, I was so depressed. First 10, 12 years ago, I saw my entire life work was such a colossal waste. And then I got a call. And uh, it was a perfect call. I just turned 60, 2004. And St. John Paul, at that time Pope John Paul, elected me to the Pontifical Academy of Science. It's honestly the most amazing institution I've ever seen. I have seen a lot of top institutions. It traces back its origins to 1600, so it's the oldest scientific academy in the world. One third are Nobel laureates from physics, chemistry, economics, all the disciplines you can think of. And the mem it's multiracial, and it doesn't worry about what your religious belief is. It's purely non-sectarian. You're elected to the academy for your scientific excellence. After joining the academy within two, three years, I realized the power of this academy to make change because it's housed within a major religious uh, institution. So under uh, Pope Benedict, he commissioned me and one other Nobel laureate to organize, uh, uh, and Paul Crutzen, to organize a meeting on the glaciers, which we did. And that meeting made me the optimist I am now, which is that 
this problem can and will be solved. So we briefed Pope Benedict. Then he asked us to commissioned us to organize this meeting. I teamed up with the Cambridge economist, Pratha Das Gupta. Sustainable humanity, sustainable nature, that's the name we came up with. And then Archbishop Minarath, who joined us, added the word, our responsibility. You know, honestly, till then, I had never thought of it as our responsibility. It was just a scientific problem I was studying. Okay? So at the end of it, we had the world's best thought leaders, several Nobel laureates, physicists, theologians, and many philosophers. And at the end of it, we came to this remarkable simple conclusion, which is sustainable relationship with nature requires a fundamental change in our attitude towards nature, nature and towards each other. And therefore, it requires moral leadership. Mind you, all of us who signed are natural and social scientists, and we are talking about moral leadership. And at the end of that workshop, or you know, so made whatever you call, I had the opportunity to brief Pope Francis. Normally, at the end of this meeting, when we be, when we brief the Holy Father, it was always in the in a breathtaking hall. It's St. Peter's Basilica. This pope, true to his reputation, met us at the parking lot <laughs> behind St. Uh, Peter's Basilica. And because there are three or four of us had planned to brief them, we thought we had about half an hour, 40 minutes, and you can't stay that long in a parking lot, right? So they, I was asked to summarize, and they gave me two minutes and maximum three sentences. So I had to give the parking lot pitch <laughs> to the moral leader of the world about morality. Imagine that. So first, uh, first sentence I told him was that climate change has become a problem of historic proportions. And the second sentence I told him was what I had presented that more, more than 50% of the climate pollution is from the wealthiest one billion, while the poorest three billion are going to suffer the worst consequences. It was amazing. At the time he was smiling, he asked me in Spanish, I didn't understand what he said. The chancellor uh, interpreted for me that the Holy Father wants to know what he can do about it. I wish I had... I was very happy with the first two sentences. I wish I had told him something else, but I told him, could you please, when you give your discourse, ask people to be better stewards of the planet? And Archbishop Minerath, Ram, you just were telling the Pope what he has been saying for the last several decades. So anyway, uh, at the end of that, when I realized this alliance between science, religion, and policy, the science journal asked Das Gupta and I to summarize this, and this is, not our, this is what came out of the meeting. Okay? So finding ways to develop a sustainable way with the planet requires not only the engagement of scientists, political leaders, and civil societies, but ultimately a moral revolution. So the theme kept coming up and again, and the scientists became fixated on that. Religious institutions can and should take the lead on bringing about such a new attitude towards creation. So I became an optimist, became happy because remember now we are past the buck from science and policy makers. They are hopeless. We have waited for them <laughs> to religious leaders. And why? Because it's an ethical, moral issue. Neither scientists nor policymakers, we have that liberty to talk about ethics and morality, but faith leaders have. And then, remarkably, over the next year and a half, our workshop was May 14th, Pope Francis organized a just amazing set of meetings. First was with the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon was there, and series of meetings when he brought all the faith leaders, we linked climate change, poverty, and trafficking, and slavery, okay? 
And then this was a meeting where the last meeting in July, where he invited over 80 mayor leaders. And uh, now I, you can see our governor, Jerry Brown, I had a role in bringing him up. It was an amazing insight by the Vatican. I asked him, why mayors? He said, look, this problem has to be solved by the cities. We bring them on board, okay? So, and then, you know, I, I want to quote from this. This is my most favorite uh, paragraph there. Today, we have to realize the true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment, the three billion who are going to suffer, so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. So I want to give you one example about how we can help cry of the poor. It's a project I'm personally involved in. Going back to that cooking, the village women and children pay a huge price for cooking in the rudimentary way. It kills four million people, the air pollution, the soot and other noxious stuff which comes up wood fire smoke, okay? And it also plays havoc on their property, on their farms, because they're removing trees. So we came up with this cook stove, which still uses biomass, because they have to use biomass, that's the only thing which they can afford, which is free. But the question is, it was too expensive, it was $80. So my daughter, who joined me on this project, she's a wireless technologist, put a wireless sensor in each of the stove, so we know when she's using it. And we used my climate science to convert that into climate credits. So we are, convert, we are hooking each village woman to the global climate market. And basically, I call these women, we are now going to start one in Nigeria, as they are the climate warriors for us. They're sort of going to be a role model for us to cut our own carbon pollution. So the final thing on my topic, I'm ready to finish, uh, is that, so what confidence do I have to come to an August party like this and claim there is an alliance forming? That came to me three months ago when the chief editor of science, Marsha McNutt, she's now going to become the president of the National Academy of Sciences, asked us to write about this miracle which was happening at the Vatican. So we titled our paper, it came out last week, Pursuit of Integral Ecology. And I'm so happy our honored guest today, keynote speaker, Archbishop, focused on the integral ecology. That's the best part as for us from a scientific view. So we, talk, we summarize that, just what I finished, and we conclude the real innovation is this new synergy between science, policy, and religion. I feel what's happening to the planet, what's happening to the poor, and what's going to happen to generations of our children, grandchildren, has to be taught in every church, every synagogue, every mosque, every temple. I feel that's only the time we're going to get the massive public support we need. Thank you.